Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, sitting in for Barbara Altman. Our guest today is Leland M. Roth, Emeritus Professor of Architectural History in the U of O School of Arch uh, Architecture and Allied Arts. He held the Marion Dean Ross Distinguished Professorship of Architectural History for 18 years. Roth's primary field of research is American architecture and urban planning, especially from 1865 to 1940. His recent interests include Oregon architecture and Native American architecture. Roth has authored many books and texts, including American Architecture a History, considered the standard text on American architecture. He's currently finishing work on two books, one on the wide-ranging work of Oregon architectural designer and preservation activist John Young, and the other on the history of Oregon's architecture. Roth gave a lecture titled Marion Dean Ross, A Man Who Left a Hole in the Water on January 25, 2012. His talk was given in conjunction with the exhibit Marion Dean Ross, The Legacy of a Scholar on display during winter 2012 in the Knight Library. Leland, welcome to you both today. Thanks for taking the time to speak with Glad us. Glad to be here. Thank you. Can you tell us who Marion Dean Ross was? <laughs> um, well, that's what my lecture was all about. Um, he was my immediate predecessor, taught here when I came in 1947 uh, and retired in 1978, uh, which is when I arrived. Um, when he began, uh, there was no Department of Art History. Uh, there was the School of Architecture and Allied Arts, one single faculty uh, with various people doing uh, different specialties. Uh, the school was divided up into departments in 1963, and he was appointed uh, the department head in art history. He was actually trained as an architect, uh, but actually uh, did his graduate work in architecture at Harvard. Uh, at a time when Walter Gropius was uh, bringing modernism uh, to Harvard and to the United States. So that was Marion's background. But uh, for someone who studied with Gropius, um, who very much disliked teaching history and more or less threw history out of architecture schools, uh, Marion Ross was a keen um, observer of history and student of history uh, and brought that dualism uh, to his teaching here and then switched entirely to art history uh, in the latter part of his life. What did you mean by a man who left a hole in the water? Uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was a phrase that my father-in-law came up with. Actually, he intended it more as a derogatory term uh, to put someone down who was thinking they were too big for their britches. Uh, and he would say, well, if you think you have such an impact on history, stick your hand in the water and then pull it out. Does it leave a hole? Well, that's about as much impact as you can expect to have on history. Um, but I differed with that. I thought that uh, Marion left a hole in the water because of the enormous number of people, students, um, people interested in architectural history and preservation uh, all across the country uh, who were, had an impact on their lives through him. And I thought he did leave a hole in the water. <laughs> Um, can you, do you know why Ross pursued the study of architecture? Do you have any idea? Did he ever tell you that? I never heard that directly from him. I think there are folks that know that part of him better than I do. Uh, but uh, apparently that was decided fairly early because he took an undergraduate degree in, in architecture at uh, what was in Pennsylvania State College. Uh, he grew up in Pennsylvania and then uh, decided on graduate work at Harvard uh, to get a a uh, master's degree in architecture. So you mentioned that he studied with Gropius, who, as you point out, is one of the leaders of modernism in architecture. Right, right. But he developed this focus on the history of architecture. Yes. Was that? Do you think that was a reaction against modernism, or do you have any idea where that interest he, in history came from? Uh, he was certainly interested in um, in areas of nineteenth-century architectural history that most modernists really despised. Now, where he got that passion, I'm not quite sure. Maybe it was the buildings he grew up with in Pennsylvania. Um, but whatever the case, um, he, he, I remember hearing lectures uh, that he taught on, say, 19th century architecture, buildings such as our own uh, D.D. Hall or Villard Hall, which in the 1950s and 60s were at their absolute nadir of uh, recognition and appreciation. And we tore them down uh, left and right. 
Um, and Marion, um, you know, argued against that, and he tried to persuade people to save those buildings, and was successful. Well, you've 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 uh, started to answer my next question, which is, what impact did he have on the field of architecture? Well, he had uh, certainly uh, there are architects now practicing. Um, for example, to name one that I know of and has spoken with, and that's John Paul Jones, who has done some work here on campus, um, very widely recognized across the country. Um, and he talks about the impact that Marion had on him when he was a student. Um, I've talked with other architects who uh, say that he left an indelible mark on them. He left a hole in their water, so to speak. Um, and he also trained a whole generation of people who went on to work in the State Historic Preservation Office or for the National Park Service or for, um, uh, for various um, um, federal agencies in Washington uh, directing preservation services. Uh, so it was a very wide impact in both of those fields. Um, do you know how his interest in Oregon architecture in particular developed? Um, well, he actually was stationed here uh, when he went into the service in World War II. Um, he was born in 1913, so he would have been in his 30s uh, when the war came. Um, and he enlisted, and he was sent to uh, Camp Abbott, uh, which was um, just south of Bend at that time. Um, it's pretty much disappeared, although there is at least one building that's now part of Sun River. That was the, I think, the officer's mess uh, for Camp Abbott. And he, um, he opted to take some additional work um, at um, uh, the camp that was up near uh, Corvallis, just north of Corvallis, Camp Adair, uh, where he took special language study in Spanish. So that got him interested in Oregon's architecture. In Apparently, yes, that was uh, his introduction to Oregon. So he came here, and I, I can't remember where he was. Where was he before he came to the University he, um, of Oregon? He taught very briefly at Pennsylvania State College. Then he got a position at Tulane University and taught there in the architecture school. Uh, and then the war came, um, and that's when he came to Oregon. So he taught at the U of O for thirty-one years. Yes. Can you say anything specific about how his tenure shaped the School of Architecture and Allied Arts in particular? Uh, I think if I looked up our, um, the old um, university bulletin. I think there were five um, historians um, in the, the newly established Department of Art History in 1963. Um, and he added, over time, added one more person after another building up that department so it could offer a whole range of courses from classical antiquity. Um, he added the three uh, Asian specialists. Um, he added uh, a specialist in American architecture, which is Marion Donnelly. Um, and uh, so now we have 11, 12 faculty members all together in all these different special branches. And you mentioned his interest in preservation, and I, I, yes. I gather that he was not just a professor of, of architecture, but also, as you say, an active preservationist. Can you say a little bit more about that aspect of his Well, career? one of the things um, that he did very shortly after arriving in Oregon, uh, he became interested in Jacksonville. Uh, and Jacksonville, at that time in the 1950s, was pretty much a forgotten place. Um, it would have been a thriving town, except that the railroad decided to go past it rather than through it. Uh, and in many cases, that was a death knell for communities. Once uh, the, you know, the traffic and the business associated with the railroad went elsewhere, uh, people did too, and um, Jacksonville kind of just went to sleep. Uh, but he was intrigued by it because it was a you know, wonderful old mining community that had basically um, dropped into amber in uh, 1884 and never really grew much after that. So all of its old buildings survived, uh, almost untouched. Uh, so it was a, a microcosm of early Oregon um, that was remarkably well preserved, not so much through design, but through benign neglect at that point. And he began writing about it. He published an article on it. Um, uh, he actually uh, conducted a 
historic American buildings uh, survey team um, mm -hmm. that did a survey of the town. And what they would do would be take photographs, they would do write-ups on the uh, important buildings, uh, do measured drawings of important buildings. All those documents go into the Library of Congress. So uh, that's a permanent record that was created uh, through his direction um, in the 1960s. And was the town put on the historical register? Yes, it was uh, a national historic district, which is a little unusual at the time. It was one of the first historic districts. What year was that? Uh, 67, I believe. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Plus or minus a year, maybe. Um, so I'm going to switch and start asking you questions about yourself. All right. Okay. You came to the university in uh, 1978 to replace Ross when he retired. Right. How did it feel to follow in those very large footsteps? It was very, they were very big shoes. Um, and I, I had known him um, through national organizations and had met him um, through um, um, friends and acquaintances at national meetings, but I didn't really get to know him well. But even uh, at that point, I was very intimidated by him. Seemed very correct, very proper, always exceedingly well dressed, um, and it just seemed like a, a very particular, uh, very uh, unique individual. Uh, and when I learned more about him when I came and when I came here, I found out that that perception was absolutely right. Um, he was, he could be a little gruff. Uh, and that was the persona that I think he took on. Um, I actually learned that uh, he was not nearly as gruff um, when you got to know him personally. I understood from uh, the lecture that you gave that he was, qu was quite a, a rigorous and demanding professor and that was part of what contributed yes. to this reputation. Yes, he was. And I think that was, um, you know, carry over for, uh, carried over from Harvard. Um, the very high standards that he was held to, and he held those standards very high for his students as well. Tell us about the gift that Ross bequeathed to the university upon his death in 1991. This was a big surprise. Um, there were many people that knew him well um, in the department and in the school, um, but he never breathed a word of this to anyone, um, at least as so far as I know. Um, and. I remember being called into the department head's office um, probably in 1991 or thereabouts, and Ross's will had just gone through probate, and we had been notified that we were a beneficiary. And I'm not sure if we knew the size of that, uh, that um, the extent to which we were a beneficiary uh, right away, but it soon became known to us that uh, basically his entire estate had been bequeathed to the Department of Art History, not to the school, but to the Department of Art History. And, and how ha has the, um, the gift uh, continued his legacy at the University of Oregon? He was very specific in his will, and he said that the, um, the state that he left was to be invested and that the uh, income from that investment was to be used, and this is where he was very specific, it was used to buy uh, books, and I think that his language was uh, artwork or drawings on uh, the history of architecture to be placed in the library here to be used by future generations. And that uh, acquisition based on that gift continues to this day? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the, uh, we generate, uh, generates, it was, about, it was about a million and a quarter dollars um, in total, and it generates um, what we receive is something like $50,000, $60,000 a year based on the market, and it fluctuates. Um, and sometimes we spend it all and sometimes we don't, and so it accumulates, and we've made some very large purchases of very old, uh, very expensive, rare books. And so his, uh, that legacy continues to benefit the library. Okay. The Marion Dean Ross Distinguished Professorship in Architectural History was established in 1992, and you held the professorship for 18 years. Can you tell us about your work and research interests? Uh, well, I've always been working in American architecture. Um, my original publication was on a New York architectural firm, very, very prestigious at the time that they practiced. Um, McKim Eden White was their name. They had, they didn't do so much work on the West Coast, although they did do a few buildings for Henry Villard when he ran the Northern Pacific Railroad, and they designed the original Portland Hotel. Um, long since gone now, was a parking lot for Meyer Frank for many years. Um, 
And actually, that's how I got interested in Oregon, was in doing that research and learning about this uh, project. Uh, was would have been a string of buildings running all the way from Minneapolis, St. Paul to Portland, Oregon, uh, with hospitals and hotels and other uh, passenger facilities along the way, but that never quite came to be. Um, but I, I published work uh, on, the, on the buildings that they did in the East. Um, I, they did the campus of Columbia University, for example, probably mm -hmm. one of their better known complexes. Um, and then um, when I um, arrived here, eventually I took over the classes on American architecture that Marion Donnelly had taught. Um, and that amounted to a full year of courses on American architecture. And then um, one of the things that I pushed the department to do as soon as I arrived, uh, I learned about the course that Marion Ross had developed on Oregon architecture. And of course, he was no longer teaching that. And at that time, they didn't have anything like the 600 hour program, uh, which. What, say what that is. I'm, I'm not sure our viewers will right. know what the 600 it's a, hour program is. It's a kind of a gradual phasing out for faculty that retire. So instead of simply walking out the door one day and being done, period. Um, you get to teach for a few more years on a reduced load, which means that um, courses that you have a particular fondness for or a specialty in that might not be able to be picked up by other people, you can continue to teach for several years. But that wasn't the case when Marion retired. He simply walked out of his office one day and that was the end. Mm -hmm. um, looking back on it, I think that's a very abrupt sort of uh, switch when you're used to dealing with students uh, daily and then suddenly that ends. But um, um, I thought we should get him to teach that Oregon class again. And one way or another, we found the funds to do that twice uh, in the next um, several years. And I, of course, I attended those classes, uh, took copious notes. Uh, and in fact, the second time that he taught it, I was uh, for a time department head. And uh, we set up that his lectures would be recorded. They were filmed and audio taped. Uh, and we have those tapes now. We're about to transfer them to DVD uh, so that um, uh, anyone who is out there who might you know, have been a student of Marion's and is interested in seeing his classes, um, they are available, uh, should you wish, uh, and just inquire at the Department of Art History. Um, so um, I took on that course, and I now teach that. And since I'm doing the 600 hours, I'm continuing to teach that Oregon class. So can you tell us a little bit about Oregon's architecture? How would you characterize Oregon's architecture? Well, originally it was uh, very much like what was happening in the East, but about 20 years later <laughs> than what was happening in the East. And that was a pretty um, uniform sort of time delay until the railroad arrived. And once that happened, then, of course, uh, the transfer of knowledge and information, the movement of people was much quicker than had been the case. And by um, the end of the 19th century, um, Oregon was on a par with architecture across the nation. In fact, because of the impact of McKimmy and White through Villard, for a very short time, they were ahead of the country. Um, certainly ahead of other places in the West that didn't have the work of McKinley and White uh, available. Um, and then the, the big change occurred in the 1930s when Oregon architects, a handful of them, began to develop a new kind of modernism that was not the concrete and steel and glass of European modernism. Um, but actually an, arch uh, an architecture that came out of local materials, local climatic conditions um, that responded to our unique Oregon landscape. And that included people like Petro Belusky and John Yan and several others. But they were the two first uh, who began to move into that area. Are there any b buildings on campus that you'd characterize as this uh, Oregon modernist style? Well, um, there's a Blue Sea building right off the edge of the campus, and that's the Central Lutheran Church, which is a good example of his of Blue Sea's church architecture. Uh, Jan never uh, designed any buildings in, in Eugene, uh, but there are buildings in Portland. And of course, well, in a way, the university has one of those Jan buildings. It's in Portland, as it happens, but that's the Watsik House, which has been given to the university and is in the process of being uh, transformed into a center of architectural studies. Interesting. So you brought up Jan. So tell us about the book that you're currently completing about him. 
Um, it's a challenging book because Jan was not like most other architects. Uh, for one thing, he never completed an architecture degree. His father died when he was a freshman at Stanford, and he had to uh, drop out of school to take over business um, dealings that his father had been involved with. Um, and he just decided not to go back. Um, in any case, he was able to do design work. Uh, he had um, draftsmen that he hired to assist him, um, but he worked independently and basically um, restricted his design work to residences. There were a few uh, commercial buildings that he designed, uh, one of which survives. Uh, it's undergone a series of changes of use, but it's now, the, as I understand, the Center for the Rose Festival. Mm -hmm. uh, for a time, it was a restaurant on the waterfront on the Willamette in Portland. Um, but that's been um, preserved. Can you say something about his style? Can you characterize it at all? It was um, very refined. He was very careful about the details. Um, but it also looked surprisingly simple. It's a simplicity that comes out of very long, detailed study. Um, sometimes you can make things look uh, very easy, but they're hard. And that's the way he went about his architecture. Is he, in your judgment, neglected? Is that why you felt the need to write a book about him? Um, yes, I think he was not um, self-promoting in the way a lot of other architects are or were. Um, he felt, I think, uncomfortable uh, doing that. Um, some who knew him well said he preferred his buildings to speak for him, not to, uh, for him to speak about himself. Uh, and anyone who visits the Watsik House could understand that because it is exquisitely detailed. The second book that you're currently writing on the architecture of Oregon is tentatively titled Building Eden. Can you explain that evocative title? Um, well, the early settlers came here to start over. Um, either there were problems back in Missouri or Kentucky or Illinois, wherever it was that they set out from. And it was also a time in the 1830s when there was a very severe business depression. Uh, and um, a lot of farmers couldn't make a go of it. Um, Jesse Applegate, I read, um, sold a whole shipment of bacon because he couldn't sell it for profit. And he sold it to a steamboat captain. And he used that bacon to fuel the boat. Um, and you can imagine someone who spent their you know, years uh, raising hogs and then curing bacon and then have to sell it to steamboat captain to fuel a boat, uh, not uh, very satisfactory. So he headed out for Oregon. Um, and I think they wanted to build a better life here. Um, and that was, that continued, um, I think, for generations. Uh, when I came to Oregon, I wanted to build a better life here. So I, uh, it kind of resonated with me. Um, and of course, there were utopian groups who came here who really wanted to create a heaven on earth, uh, such as the uh, folks that um, set, settled uh, um, Aurora. Um, so I, th I thought about taking that as a kind of a starting point. I'm not sure how long that lasted, but certainly it returned with the case of people like Jan and Beluski. They were trying to create an architecture that was unique to Oregon, um, that was uh, perfect for Oregon you might say. Um, and so it just seemed like an intriguing title. I'm not sure I'll, I'll use that when the book is actually finished, but it was a good thing to start with. Is it generally the case that um, out there in the world of architectural history that, that there's a recognized uh, style or set of achievements for Oregon architecture? Or is this something that other people outside of Oregon don't appreciate? As much as uh, it was very much appreciated um, when Jan and Beluski started their work, uh, their mature, uh, independent uh, work in the late 1930s, 1940s, and on. Uh, in fact, the buildings were featured in national magazines, magazines published in New York City, uh, but which uh, got special recognition for their response to the climate, to the landscape. The School of Architecture and Allied Arts will celebrate its centennial in 2014. Can you tell us some of the highlights of the school's history? Well, um, this school was uh, in many ways unique, um, particularly in the way it was founded. To get the school started in 1914, Ellis Lawrence was obliged, because of the way things worked then, to um, 
align himself very closely with the Beaux-Arts Institute of America. And that was an institution that sort of oversaw architectural schools, at least any architectural school that wished to have any sort of pretension or recognition. And it was a very formal, classical mode of, of instruction. Uh, but what Lawrence wanted to do was to change that. And as soon as the school was established, he disassociated himself uh, and the school from that organization and really began to teach in a much more democratic way uh, so that students weren't thrown into competition with each other, but actually helped to teach each other. Uh, that um, was a very radical sort of approach in the 20s and 30s and 40s, this idea that students and faculty work together, not uh, in a series of competitions. And is that legacy still with us in your judgment? Yes, I would say it is. Um, uh, and each new generation that comes in to teach is gradually absorbed into this ethos. Uh, now, of course, um, enlarged and enhanced with the ethos of sustainability, uh, which is an area in which our school is at the forefront. Uh, and I think uh, Lawrence would be very proud of that. Well, I think that's a lovely place to stop our <laughs> little chat. Uh, Leland, thank you very much for speaking with us today. My pleasure. We've been speaking with Leland M. Roth, Emeritus Professor of Architectural History in the School of Architecture and Allied Arts. He held the Marion Dean Ross Distinguished Professorship of Architectural History for 18 years. Marion Dean Ross, The Legacy of a Scholar, was on display in the Knight Library during winter 2012. The, ac uh, the exhibit can be accessed online at the address below. Thank you for watching.